right. So it looks like we're all here. Very good. Uh, okay, so we survived the first day of, of math. Now we're back for number two. All right, very good. All right, so what should we do today? All right, so we actually finished chapter 5A. Besides looking at the syllabus, 5A is done. So let's go over to Moodle and see what's coming up next. Uh, let's see, where is it? <laughs> see, this happens a lot. I can't, <laughs> I have so much stuff open. And now we've got to go search for it. Here we go. So yes, as you can see, we went over the syllabus, fine. 5A is done. That means 5B is next. And of course, 5C will follow that. And in the meantime, I have two very cool videos for us today. And uh, I think you'll find them to be very interesting, but why don't we do some new material first and then we'll save the fun videos for a little bit later in the, in the class today. And um, they're both related to zero. Okay, you would never think that zero would have such a fascinating uh, history, but it actually does. Okay, so after today, you will know just how cool zero really is. Okay, now in the meantime, let's pick it up where we left off. I recall from last time, we defined the uh, natural numbers. Uh, in fact, let me go reopen 5A real fast. And of course, the natural numbers, well, first things first, of course, we're only analyzing the real numbers in this class. And so we're going to slowly go through each type of real number. And we started with the uh, natural numbers, which of course are the numbers that we use to count. So for that reason, they're often known as the counting numbers. And you can see they do not have any negative numbers. They do not have any fractions and they do not contain a zero. It's just the ones that we use to count, literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to positive infinity. And then we went through and, and analyzed a lot of interesting results. But now we're gonna introduce another category for uh, the natural number, uh, sorry, the real numbers, and that would be the whole numbers. Now, as you can see, the whole numbers aren't very different than the natural numbers. The only thing that's different here is the zero. So zero has been added to the whole, uh, natural numbers. And so now we have the so-called whole numbers. Now, um, if you recall last time, we briefly touched on uh, set theory. I just want to point out that because of the way they're defined, the natural numbers are a set which contains the numbers from one, two, three, four, all the way up to infinity. So we can make the claim that in terms of sets, the natural numbers, I'm going to use the special notation, the natural numbers, hold on, I don't want to be too sloppy here. The natural numbers the whole numbers. And all that means is that the natural numbers are completely contained within the whole numbers. And in fact, everything from this point up is one of the natural numbers. So all we really did here was add zero to the natural numbers to create the so-called whole numbers. <clears throat> now, as we'll see in the video in a bit, um, the number zero took a long time to be developed. Um, it, it didn't seem to make sense to humanity until eventually mathematicians began to realize that there was a strong need for it. So zero um, was invented far after the natural numbers. And then <clears throat> after that was developed, we have this, suddenly we have this idea of negative numbers. Now you can imagine that when the idea was first uh, proposed, people must have thought it very strange to think in terms of negative numbers. So by adding negatives, we now have a new set, which is referred to as the integers, okay? So you notice all of a sudden, we now have a zero and we have negatives. We haven't seen that yet. And also because this set now goes all the way down to, uh, up to positive infinity and all the way down to negative infinity, we need these dots going in both directions, okay? Because what we're seeing here is that this set covers the entire territory from negative to positive infinity. 
And now we can make another interesting statement. While n is a subset of the whole numbers, the whole numbers are now a subset of the integers. Okay, so in other words, we're creating a progressively larger set of numbers as we uh, continue to classify the real numbers. So remember this little symbol, it looks like a C, but it actually is meant to indicate is a subset of. Okay, and again, you can tell these are sets because of the use of the braces. Okay. Now you can see that there's still more numbers that are missing. Um, in particular, we don't see any numbers in here that have a fractional component. That will come next. Okay, but for now we have only numbers that have a that are whole, let's say. In other words, there's no fractional component. And so now we've extended our set to include zero and the negatives. So what I'm going to do is show you a diagram, which I'm sure you've seen before. And when you see it again, you'll say, oh, that's right. I forgot all about this. Uh, to illustrate better what we're doing here, we're going to draw a box, a special kind of box. Okay. And this box represents all the real numbers. By the way, I also want to introduce some notation here. It's often the case in math that we use this fancy R to represent the real numbers. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, so don't, we don't have to keep writing out the word real numbers. When you see this fancy R, <clears throat> this represents the real numbers. So this box contains all the real numbers. And within this box, this big circle will represent the integers. Uh-huh, now, before I go any further, does anyone remember what kind of uh, diagram we're looking at here? It has a special name. Oh, it's been so long. This is what we call a Venn diagram. It's set up to represent sets and how they're related to each other. So the I completely contains the whole numbers, which in turn completely contains the natural numbers. Now, of course, you can see there's plenty more that we haven't addressed yet, but we will. But right now, you can see that based on this diagram, um, N is contained within W, which is contained within I. Now, what does this remind you of? You may have seen these um, on TV, or maybe you actually have some. Let me just get a diagram going here for us. And you'll say, oh, I've seen these before. I don't know if you've ever seen these Russian dolls but they're built so that you see what's happening. The biggest doll contains the second biggest, which contains the third biggest, and it works all the way down to the smallest doll. They're all identical to each other, but they all fit within the side of each other. And in fact, some of these Russian dolls can have as many as 50 or 60 dolls contained inside. So I don't know, to me, that's the best analogy I can think of for what we're doing here. So imagine the biggest doll is the integers, the second biggest doll is the whole numbers, and the third doll is the uh, natural numbers. Has anyone ever seen these before? Sure, of course you have. You've heard about these. And that's why they're so cool. And everyone loves these things because they're all the same, except they all fit inside each other. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's what this reminds me of. Russian dolls. <laughs> okay, now. Um, then we have some basic definitions that we want to run through right now before we get back to the real number system. Now, here's an interesting one, opposites. Now, this doesn't mean what you think it means, okay? In real life, if two people are opposites, it means they have very different characteristics. But here, it only means that we have two numbers that have the same magnitude, but they have different signs. So in other words, three and negative three are said to be opposites because the, they're different only in their sign. Okay, so you can think of a million examples, two and negative two are opposites because they're the same number with a different sign. 
Okay, so in math, yeah, we do have a lot of terminology that, you know, sounds like things you run across in the real world, but often it means something a little different. All right. Now the next one, everybody remembers this one. Absolute value. Remember how that works? Um, what it basically does is it removes the sign from another, a number. So in other words, the absolute value of negative two is two, but the absolute value of two is also two. And so basically, now why is this happening? Well, this comes in handy for certain types of applications where we may have a number which is negative, but we don't really need the negative. So it may be more useful just to focus our attention on the actual number. So we may think in terms of absolute values instead of worrying about the sign. Okay, so for certain types of uh, calculations, the result it may be negative, <clears throat> but what we basically do is just get rid of the negative sign and focus on the number itself. Now you might remember the graph of the absolute value from high school. It's actually pretty interesting. Um, if I already draw this thing out, and you look at it and you'll say, oh, that's right. I forgot all about that. If you go to your XY coordinate system and try to graph the function Y equals absolute value of X, you're gonna wind up with a big V. Okay, that's what it looks like. So in other words, imagine if X is, or let's say this is three if X is three, Y is three, but if X is negative three, <clears throat> Y is also negative three. And that's why it looks like this. It's a big V. And also you notice there's no values below the horizontal axis because Y cannot be negative. Okay, great. Now we have a few more and then, um, for example, we have this notion of proper fractions. All right, now again, you know, the word proper in, in real life, I mean, it means something that's acceptable, I guess you could think of it as, um, but here, what we're saying is that if a fraction has a smaller numerator than a denominator, And that's true in each of these cases. Now here we're ignoring the sign, by the way. <clears throat> as long as the numerator is smaller than the denominator, then the result is what we will call a proper fraction. I have no idea where this name comes from, by the way. Um, <laughs> so all that matters is that the numerator is smaller than the denominator. And if you have forgotten, the numerator is what is on top and the denominator is what's on bo the bottom. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you've been away from math for a while, you know, it's easy to start forgetting um, all this fun stuff that you learned along the way. But now our job is to get it all back so that we never forget it again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we want to make sure it's all fresh in our memories. All right. So anyway, how, now in English, what is the opposite of proper? Okay, so let's say you're an English major and this is your, your specialty um, language. Oh, here we go. Improper, that's right, exactly. English is a very strange little language. Um, there's so many ways in which the rules are inconsistent with each other. Um, you probably are aware of the fact that um, English has such a, it's so strange because England has been conquered so many times by so many different countries. Every time they were overrun by somebody, they just absorbed the new language and turned it into a bigger form of English. So that's one of the reasons why so many of our words are based on Latin, because you know the Romans occupied uh, England um, from about, let's say, 50 BC to about 400 AD. So 
That's why so much English is based on Latin, but it also is why then the Vikings come along and conquer them and all these other tribes conquer them. <clears throat> so we have a lot of strange words in English. But anyway, so it should be pretty clear that if this is how we define a proper fraction, then an improper fraction would be the ones where the numerator is larger than the denominator. Okay, so in the, all of these cases, the numerator is larger than the denominator. And that's all it takes to be called a, an improper fraction. Now, of course, in this day and age, when we have calculators, you don't normally leave numbers like this. Like if you need to figure out the cost of something or a price, for example, eight sevenths, you would normally just take your calculator out and divide and you'd come up with a decimal equivalent, which would be about a dollar fourteen. But if you are dealing with fractions for some reason, um, mathematicians, for whatever reason, um, prefer to avoid these. But, um, you know, all we hear, all we care about is the proper terminology, proper and improper. Now, we also have this other concept, which is closely related to these two, which is called the mixed number. So like, look at this one, one and two twenty thirds. You notice what it has here. It has a whole number plus a fraction. So when we have both of these together, we call this a mixed number. It's not a pure fraction, although we could convert it into one if we wanted to. How would you do that in this case? What could you do with one and two? Uh, just for review, how would you turn this into a fraction? <clears throat> what could you do? Ah, well, okay. So if you're getting rusty, let me show you a little trick here. Suppose it's your mission in life to turn this from a mixed number into a, a fraction of some kind. What you could do, oh, here we go. Yes, exactly. So what I'm gonna do is rewrite this as 23 20 thirds plus two 20 thirds, because of course this is just one. And now look what I've got, 25 20 thirds, and I have myself a fraction. Now it may be an improper fraction, but it is a fraction. So if there's some reason, now you, you don't see this very often anymore, these mixed numbers. Normally, um, if you have a mixed number, it's probably easier to convert it into a fraction. And then if you choose to do so, you can then turn it into a decimal. Um, like your calculator doesn't really deal well with fractions it automatically converts everything into uh, decimals. If you really want fractions, you need a more uh, powerful calculator than the one you have. They, they do exist. There are some on the market that will take any uh, decimal and convert it into a ratio or a fraction for you. It's kind of fun, but you don't really need it. All right, what else do we have here? The order of operations. Now, there is nobody who has forgotten how this works. Let me write out a little chart for you because I think it's easier to visually see it than look at a bunch of uh, writing. What always comes first is parentheses. What comes after parentheses in this order of operations? Oh, we have somebody who knows exponents. Okay, what's next? That's right. It's basically a tie between multiplication and division. And what comes last? Well, well, now we know by process of elimination, <clears throat> it must be addition and subtraction. That's right. You know it. Now, some people were in, in their early years taught a mnemonic device for this, which 
who remembers what it code, how it's how that word looks. What word were you taught to memorize in order to help you understand this? That's the one. PEMDAS. Why? What is that helping you with? How does that help you? PEMDAS. What is that supposed to mean? Well, you can see parentheses, P for parentheses, exponentiation. Um, multiplication, division, addition, and finally subtraction. That's what it's for. Okay. Oh, um, that one is for the planets, I think, isn't it? Um, no, please excuse P-E-M does. Oh, oh, I see. How do you like that? I forgot all about that one. Oh, um, whoever's raising their hand, um, you can. I think you can ask your question here um, on the uh, chat. Okay, yeah, that you know what? That's absolutely correct. I actually forgot about that. Um, it's a way to help little kids remember this. But I did want to point out, and this is a point of English, uh, a word like this that is designed just to help you memorize something has a very special but complicated name. It's called a mnemonic device. Where now you can see this MN is insane. It's a Greek word. A mnemonic device is designed to help you memorize something. And there's many of them. I remember from high school um, physics and you were learning about the spectrum. Uh, does this one look familiar? What is that supposed to help you memorize? I bet at least some of you remember. Oh, oh, here we go. The colors of the rainbow. In other words, the rainbow has the colors in this order. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Oh, that one slipped through the cracks, I see. Um, okay, see, there, there's so many of them kicking around out there. Roy G. Biv. <laughs> see how it sticks in your memory? Yes, exactly. Somewhere over the rainbow, yes. Roy G. Biv, now see how that sticks in your memory. If you had to memorize this list, how long would it stay in your memory? A month, maybe? But with Roy G. Biv, you're never gonna forget this again as long as you live. And in fact, while we're on the subject of mnemonics, um, this is always fun because we, it's so easy and quick with, uh, with the internet. Let's try this. Okay, by medieval Latin from the Greek, mnemonikos. Um, mindful. Oh, okay. Oh, now what is that one supposed to be? My very eccentric mother just served us nachos. I'm not familiar with that one. Is that the planets? Oh my God. I never heard of that one before. Now you notice there's no S at the end. Uh, I'm sorry, no P. For a while, apparently the scientists decided that Pluto wasn't a planet, but apparently now they think it is again. Yeah, so now you have to come up with maybe nachos platter or something like that. Um, yeah, did you know that Pluto is now? Oh, okay, um, Pluto is back in in the in the club. Um, yeah, so remember a while back, were you upset when they decided that Pluto was not a planet anymore? Then if were you not sad and depressed for poor Pluto? Oh, maybe you were too young to care about it, but <laughs> according to the International, International Astro Astronomical Union, the organization charged with naming, let me move this a little bit, all celestial bodies and deciding on their statuses. Oh, wait a minute. Pluto is still not an official planet. Oh, come on. Oh, I don't think these guys know what they're doing.
Oh, come on. All right. Well, whatever. I guess it's still up in the air. Poor Pluto. Yeah. I think in Roman mythology, Pluto was the god of the underworld. So not, not a nice character. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, he was the one who was in charge of people going, you know, well, all right, anyway, poor Pluto. Really, he was nicer than Jupiter? Oh, okay. <laughs> you all realize, I mean, all the planets are named after Roman gods. Um, and so, as are many of the stars, yeah. Except Earth itself. That, I don't know where they came up with that. That's not one of the Roman gods. All right. Anyway, so I guess we should get back to math now. Um, so let's take a look at some of these cases. Now, this is one of the reasons why we need to get so much practice with our calculators, because it's easy to make mistakes, um, especially with the parentheses. So like here, for example, what if you had this expression? The way it's written, according to the rules, you should do the three squared first then multiply the result by three, and only then at the end add the four. And if you do that, you'll get 31. And that's great if that's what the writer intended. Okay, so in fact, why don't you take out your calculator and make sure that this works properly? Because I think we can practice, all the practice we can get is good practice. All right, and you'll see this one should not require any parentheses. It should be able to take care of this for you automatically but why don't we get some practice here? <clears throat> All right, so three squared. So this actually helps because then you may, if you've never used this calculator before, you may not even realize where some of these buttons are. The square is in the upper left-hand corner. Um, the multiplication is in the far right side. Um, the one thing I do want to point out is that when you get to the end, you do need the equal sign. For the intermediate cases here, we don't really need them. Okay, so did it work? Now, don't forget about the special trick we have seen. Oops. Um, turn it on its side and you'll get your wonderful, full, high-powered scientific calculator. <coughs> mm. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right, now, what if the intention, though, was to do this? So what I'd like you to do without showing me what the actual answer turns out to be, see if you can figure out what this is with your calculator. Now, logically, you can see that we're going to do what's in the parentheses first, but I want you to be able to get this out of your calculator. All right, so let's try that. So if you're not, now the answer is 63. If you're not getting that on the calculator, what you need to do is hit three it has to be in this sequence. It has to be three. Then you hit the X squared button. You got it. Okay, wonderful. All right. Beautiful. All right, let's get that out of here. Hit the X squared button. That should show a nine in your window. Then you're going to hit times. Open parentheses. Now, by the way, it does not show the parentheses after you've typed it. Then you can do three plus four, okay, within the parentheses. Then you close the parentheses, and then you hit the equal sign. And that should give you 63. So just be aware that on this calculator, at least, when you use parentheses, it doesn't actually show them. I don't know why, it just doesn't. So, um, Give it a shot and you'll see that whether you look at it algebraically or with your calculator, you should get a 63. All right. 
nice. Now, here we go. Now we're going to get back to defining the numbers, the real numbers. Now, we did say before that we have not yet introduced any numbers that have a fractional component. So we're going to do that right now. We're going to introduce a series of numbers called the rational numbers. Now, and of course, in the real world, rational simply means you are sensible, you make good decisions, that kind of thing. Here, though, what we're focused on in this word is this word ratio. And so the bottom line here is that a rational number is any number that can be expressed as the ratio of two integers. So as a simple example, 2.4 is a rational number because we can write it as 12 over 5. That is all it needs to be considered rational. And you notice it does have a decimal here. So it's not an integer. This is not an integer. It is a rational number. Um, negative 1.9 is also rational because we can write it as negative 19 over 10. And therefore, this is also a rational number. And you notice the rational numbers can be either positive or negative. Now, some of them are not as obvious as others. These are pretty obvious. If you see these numbers, it's pretty uh, easy to identify them as rational. But we're going to see some cases where it's not so easy. Okay. Well, now. How about zero? Um, now, often when we define any type of situation in math, we have to be very careful with zero. But zero does count as a rational number because zero could be written as zero over one or zero over two or three. So zero is rational. Okay, so that's, there's frequently, if there's a special case in any definition that we come up with, frequently zero um, is potentially at least an exception, but not here. Zero is considered to be rational. Okay, now, oh, all right, I spoiled the fun. What's the opposite of rational? That would be irrational. Uh, okay. So all this means is that if a number that cannot be expressed as the ratio of two integers is said to be irrational. Now, there's one here that everybody knows very well, and that's your old friend, pi. All right, nobody has forgotten pi. You spent a lot of time analyzing it when you were studying geometry. But there are others as well. Now, this one you might not be familiar with, E, is also a value. If you notice, like pi, after the decimal point, we have an infinite number of digits and they do not repeat. So that's what they have in common with each other. If you notice, after the decimal, we have an infinite number. All right, let me, oh, sorry. After the decimal, we have an infinite number of non-repeating digits. And that's how you can uniquely identify an irrational number. Same thing with square root of two, who knew? There's an infinite number of non-repeating digits after that decimal point, and that's how we identify it as an irrational number. Now we're going to see um, some 
more rules that help us tell whether numbers are rational or irrational. But before we do that, what I'd like to point out here is that if you look at the real numbers, um, let, let's ask ourselves the following question. Are the integers rational numbers? In other words, for example, is five a rational number? Okay. So now, of course, ideally, you would want to come up with an explanation if you're instead of just saying yes or no. What do you think about five? Do um, you think that qualifies? Yes, because it is five over one. Exactly. Okay, because since five equals five over one, it is the ratio of two integers and therefore rational. Okay, now since the whole numbers are a subset of the integers, that implies that the whole numbers are also rational as are the natural numbers. Okay, so in other words, all the definitions we had up till this point, the natural numbers, the whole numbers, the integers, they're all rational. So what about these mysterious irrational numbers? What, oh, by the way, I wanna show you this in a Venn diagram now. So we're finally gonna be done with our classification for the real numbers um, when we're done with this. So what I'm gonna do is draw it out this way. We'll draw the box. So these will be the rational numbers on the left-hand side. These will be the irrational. And then we have our sets within. So we have irrational, I'm sorry, integers, whole numbers and natural numbers. So I hope that makes sense then, that you can see that the natural numbers are a subset of the um, whole numbers, which are a subset of the integers, which are then a subset of the, there, there's no letter here for rational. Some books use Q for this, but we'll just call it rational numbers. <clears throat> but you notice none of these are irrational. They all are in the same side of the box. Everything else is irrational. And this now constitutes all of the real numbers. Okay, so this is basically our classification scheme now. Within, we've got irrational and we've got rational numbers. Within the rationals, we have integers, which contain the whole numbers, which contain the natural numbers. So now everybody is accounted for. Okay, every real number falls into one of these categories. And so we're all set now. We don't have to define any more new types of real numbers because now we have them all covered. Well, that's a relief. I'm sure you were wondering what was going on with the rest of the real numbers that we didn't introduce. So um, now, what we're gonna do now is focus on some techniques for identifying uh, rational and irrational numbers. Now, like I said, in many cases, it's pretty obvious if a number is rational, but in many cases it is not. 
Um, oh, by the way, one more thing I want to write. This is um, something you can do with set theory. The real numbers are now formally the union of the rational numbers. And the irrational numbers. And this symbol you might recall represents what we call union, which is what we're, we're, means that we're combining the two sets into one new set, the real numbers. <clears throat> All right. So now we're ready for what comes next. We're going to introduce a couple of new key terms here for our numbers. Um, a number that has a finite number of digits after the decimal point, we will define it as a terminating decimal. So that would be, for example, 3.75 or 2.914 or let's say 7.01634. What do these all have in common? They only have a finite number of decimals after, uh, digits after the decimal point. They don't go on and on forever. On the other hand, a number that has an infinite number of repeating digits after the decimal point is said to be repeating. So an example of that would be this, 0 0.33333. And you notice how it just goes on forever. We can write the three dots to indicate that this is going on forever. And here's some notation that you might not have ever seen before. When we have this situation, we can write this as 0 0.3 with a little bar over it, which means the three is being repeated an infinite number of times. In fact, your calculator may actually use this uh, notation. This is a repeating decimal. This is terminating, all right? Now, you may recognize this one. This is actually a fraction. What fraction is this? Ooh, you don't recognize it? It's one third. If you go to your calculator and type one divided by three, this is exactly what you're going to get. All three is after the decimal point. Now, why am I bringing up these definitions? Because, oh, here's some more examples. Terminating decimals, you can see that after the digit, uh, decimal, we only have a finite number of digits. These are repeating. Now, by the way, the pattern with which it repeats doesn't have to be restricted to a single number. See here, we've got a repeated series of one fives. That still counts, all right? Or we could have like, let's say 7.231, 231, 231. This still counts because the pattern is two, three, one. Well, why does this matter? Because terminating and repeating decimals are rational. So as soon as you see that a number either ha is terminating or repeating, we know right away it is a rational number. In spite of the way it appears, all of these are rational numbers. Might not have thought so, but they are. Okay. So that's why this is so important. Now, you know, a lot of times these terminating decimals can be easily converted into a uh, fraction. So you can see right away, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, like this one, who you might not recognize it as a, it's terminating, but it's rational because look how easily I can convert that into a ratio. In fact, every number that is terminating can be written as a ratio of some number to a power of 10. And that's what I've done here. 
So the terminating decimals are easy to figure out. It's easy to look at it and say, yes, this must be rational because it's easy to convert it into a ratio. The repeating decimals are a different story altogether. It's not all that easy to convert these into a ratio. There's a special technique I'm about to show you, which makes it easier. And I think you'll find it very interesting. Okay. Um, let's look at how this works. Um, I'll tell you what, let's look at an example before um, I show you all the formal steps. So let's say we have this number. 0 0.88888, which can be just as easily written as 0 0.8 bar. Now, this is clearly a repeating decimal. The question is what ratio equals 0 0.8 bar? Okay, we'd like to find that ratio so we can prove that this number is rational. So here's our strategy, watch this. Let's define N to be 0 0.8 bar. And when you see this, you'll say, oh, this is so simple. If that's the case, and remember, this is equal to 0 0.88888 and goes on and on and on forever. If that's the case, what is the value of 10n? Well, that in decimal form, it's going to be 8.88888. But we can write it as 8.8 .8 bar. So you might say, well, so what? Watch what we can do now. What if I subtract one from the other? What am I left with? We can see these guys all cancel each other out. And so I'm gonna wind up with nine N equals eight, which means that N equals eight ninths, and there's your ratio. So I just proved that this number is nothing but eight ninths, which means that it must be rational. And if you don't believe it, type this into your calculator and you'll see that that's exactly what it's going to give you. Although it might round one of the last ones up to nine, but that's what you're getting. Wow, that wasn't so painful, was it? No. All right, well, that's good. That means we maybe we can do a couple more all right, this is good. Everybody understands it. All right, and so the instructions are all right here, of course. Now, um, oh, all right, there's no more. I'll, I'll make one up right now. Okay, how about this one? So in fact, I'm gonna ask you, this is your challenge for the morning, um, to come up with the equivalent ratio of is what ratio? All right, so I'm gonna give you a minute to figure this one out using that special technique we just learned. All right, as soon as you have a number, you can toss it right into that old chat room. Five ninths, yes, that's exactly correct. So I'm gonna show you why, because we're gonna let N, and this is of course 0.5 bar. Therefore 10 N is 5.5 .5 bar. 
the difference between the two is 9n equals 5. Now, I do want to point out, though, that this technique depends on which, how many decimals are being repeated. Let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, first, let me make sure everyone can catch up. I'm going to show you a different example. <clears throat> All right, are we ready? Okay. It looks like we're pretty much ready. All right, good. So let's try this one. Now this one is a little bit different. I'll show you how. Suppose we have something like this. which I can rewrite as 0 0.23 bar. Because it's the two and the three that are being repeated continuously. Now, in a case like this, if you let n be 0.23 bar, I don't need, I don't wanna use 10n because that won't help me because 10n will not eliminate the uh, repeated part when I subtract them. So I'm going to instead use put n. That's right, exactly. So if I turn it into 100 n, see what's gonna happen, it becomes 23.23 .23 bar, so that when I subtract, these actually are being eliminated. So I've got 99 n equals 23, or n equals 23.99. Okay, so what that tells us is that this is the part that depends on how many decimals are being repeated. If there were three being repeated, you would need to use a thousand. Okay, and if there were four being repeated, you would need to use 10,000. In other words, whatever it takes to get rid of all these repeated decimals. Otherwise, you're going to have a mess here. Okay, so let's do another practice problem. Let's say that we have 0 0.47, 47, 47. Okay, what ratio is this? Man, that was fast. Okay, so you've got, now remember this is the same thing as 0 0.47 bar. So if we let n be 0 0.47 bar, 100 n would be 47.47 .47 bar. Now I subtract, these drop out. I've got 99 n is 47 and n is 47 over 99. Now you notice there's a pattern here. The denominator almost without fail is either nine or 99 or 999. Okay, that happens quite a bit. So that just means that when you see this number that looks so frightening, it is in fact rational and we can prove it. Okay, so that means, so the irrational ones then are the ones where the repeated decimals do not repeat. I mean, the, the, the decimals do not repeat, like something like this. One, two, eight, one, nine, seven, four, two, seven, eight, two, three. They're, they're not being repeated and there's an infinite number of them. This number would be irrational. This one is rational. Okay. All right. 
Now we're coming up on a major topic here, roots and radicals, which everybody remembers, but there's a lot of interesting properties here that we need to go over. But before we do that, I think we've earned um, some fun, some fun time. We're gonna look at those two videos that I promised you. Now, here's what I want you to do. Now remember, um, we did have this issue last semester. Um, I won't be able to record these videos into the, um, the recording. I have to, I'll have to pause the screen, but what I want you to do is go to um, Moodle and uh, not Pluto, Moodle. And you'll see these are, the, I've got them listed here. We've already seen the history of mathematics. Today, we're gonna look at these two. First, let's look at what is zero. Okay, so the link is right here. And what I'm gonna do is also put it into the chat room in case you don't have like Moodle right in front of you. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause the recording. We're all gonna watch it together. And when we're done, I think you'll agree that it is a very, very interesting look at the history of the number zero. Okay, prepare to be excited, <laughs> all right? Uh, I know it's early in the morning, but yes, we can always use a little excitement in our lives. It's about five minutes long at the most. It's not that long. It's not, it's not like a movie or something. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do, first, I'm going to stop the sharing. Uh, I'm going to first, now this is it. Now, whoop, whoop. I'm going to send you this link in the chat room just in case you need it. And what I'd like you to do is watch it on your computer. Okay. And then, so let's carry on. So it's about four or five minutes long. And then when we're done, I think you'll find that it is extremely interesting. All right, let's do it. Is it The second use of zero is as a number in its own right. The middle man.
Okay, um, yeah, is everyone done? <clears throat> so that means, actually, maybe we have time for a poll here. Um, Okay, this is an opportunity to express your opinion about what we were just looking at. Yes, that was fun. I think you'll agree that that was a nice video. Um, <laughs> that's right. So now we get a chance to find out. <laughs> But yes, it was very interesting and it was also kind of fun to watch too. And that's that's a, a good video. You know it's a great video when it's entertaining as well as informative. And of course, you, you know, you don't think about these things. You just take it for granted that we ha always have had zero, but it did take a long time to come up with that idea. And you did see that it took a long time to work its way into Western Europe because we already had the Roman numerals, which by the way, one of the interesting features about the Roman numerals which you may not have ever noticed is that they did not have a zero. And that's one of the reasons why we stopped using it. Not the only reason, but that's one of the reasons. The zero was very important. So, all right, anyway, there's one more that I want you to see. Now this time, <coughs> this one is, is more about why we can't divide by zero. It's not so much the history of zero, but why, why specifically we cannot divide by zero. Now, it's a little bit more complex, but it's also fun. So I'm going to, um, well, first of all, it's on Moodle. And it's right here. It's called, why can't we divide by zero? What I'm gonna do, just like I did a minute ago, <coughs> I'm going to send you the link in the chat room, just in case you don't have Moodle open right now. Okay, you'll have to suffer through all the commercials, I think, but um, here it is. And so let's take a look at this.
<clears throat> all right, are we all done? Okay, that was pretty cool. Yes, it was a very nice, um, graphically, it was a lot of fun. And it made you think, didn't it? Ooh, it's kind of early in the morning to think, but we did it. Okay, so um, it did start to make you wonder, wow, math is interesting. There's a lot of bizarre aspects to it too. Um, and that was certainly one of them. But um, all right, anyway, so enough of that fun stuff. Now we get to go back to what we were doing. First, let me turn the recording back on. Um, here we go. All right, so we'll stop with the YouTube for now. Now, there's <clears throat> the great thing about YouTube is, of course, you have all these wonderful videos out there um, if you know where to find them. And um, so I will continue to find uh, these interesting videos for us because I think it does help bring this stuff to life when you can see a video where they're talking about these big issues and not just focus on uh, small details. So um, anyway, what we're about to do is look at something that everybody's very familiar with, and that is what we will call <clears throat> roots and radicals. Now this symbol that you're seeing in front of you is very familiar to you all. We normally pronounce that um, square root. But this is sometimes pronounced as radical X. Okay, you may have heard uh, that terminology as well. Radical X means the same thing 
as square root of x. Now, what's interesting here is that this symbol is just another way of expressing the following. This is equal to x raised to the one half power. That's what it actually means. You're taking x and raising it to the one half power. <clears throat> but I mean, it looks cool, but that's all that it represents. Now your calculator has a square root button on it, your phone calculator that is. If you wanna take a quick look at it, um, let's go find that. And if you look in the bottom, sort of left, uh, it's sort of in the middle left. Um, and on the calculator, they've written it as like this, because it means the same thing. If you leave out the number here, it's understood that this is meant to be a two or one half, x to the one half power. Now, some of the square roots, you probably have them memorized. Like for example, you wouldn't even need your calculator if I asked you for, let's say the square root of 100, what would that be? Well, clearly that would be 10. Okay, oh, here we go, yes. I didn't want to step on your toes here. 10, yes, exactly. So in other words, the square root of 100 is 10 because 10 squared is 100. So in other words, these are simply reverses or inverses of each other. That's right. <laughs> okay, so now here's a good question for you. What happens if you take, as I mentioned in the video, what happens if you take the square root of a negative number? It's, it becomes I. Now we mentioned this, I believe the other day, I is an imaginary number. And by the way, sometimes imaginary numbers are also known. Let me mention this in the slides. The square root of a negative number is known as an imaginary number, but sometimes it's called a complex number. You do hear that as well. Um, and so in principle, it's not defined. Now, we will see a video soon enough, maybe next week, where they explain this just a little bit further. And um, essentially, you can imagine, think of these as existing separately from the real number system. But occasionally, you wouldn't, you'd be surprised to discover that they do occasionally turn out to be useful in certain applied areas like engineering and statistics. We're not going to use them here, okay? <laughs> but you do know that they exist, but uh, you should be aware that um, if you do this on your calculator, it's just going to give you an error message. It's not going to show up as I in your calculator. If you try, for example, to take the square root of, um, let's say negative three, it just says the word error. Okay, it's saying, don't do that again. All right, you're upsetting me. All right, I don't like imaginary numbers. I'm a real calculator. <laughs> All right, by the way, I did, you know, I just remembered, um, you can actually buy one. Let me see if I can find this on the internet. There it is. You can actually, oh, it's hard to read that. Um, maybe we could read this one a little better. <clears throat> this is a t-shirt, you can actually buy this if you're really a math person. And so I want you to be able to see what it actually says. I is saying to pi, um, be rational. And pi says back to I, get real. Now, this is what passes for humor in math, by the way. Okay, does everyone get it? Is that your idea of cool? Is anyone gonna get online right now and buy this t-shirt? It is kind of funny, but I mean, would you actually wear this t-shirt around the campus? I don't know, if that happens, then you're, I guess then you're required to become a math major. <laughs> because then you're throwing in your lot with the math students and now you're one of them and that's it, it's all over. 
uh, you're now a mathematician for life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So yes, you can buy any t-shirt you want, but this one is very popular among mathematicians. <laughs> yeah, what, how much are they charging for this thing? It's like at least $15, oh, 17 45 54 ouch. But at least it comes in other colors. <laughs> That's kind of nice. I mean, you know, black is kind of bland. Not even including, oh, you're right. Oh, my God. By the time you're done, it's going to be at least 20 bucks. <clears throat> All right. Enough of that. Um, so th then what we're going to say is um, now here's one thing you can do. You may not take the square root of a negative number, but what you can do is multiply the square root by negative one. Okay. That's okay. The negative is on the outside. So, um, like for example, here, this is clearly seven, which means this would be negative seven. So um, this, this symbol is called this radical sign. Um, you don't need to know this, no, some, these terms, but um, every part of this expression has a name. <clears throat> Just be aware of the fact that this, is, this can be referred to as radical 49. And it means the same thing as the square root of 49. Okay, um, now if you take, if you square a radical, it just returns the original number. Okay, in the same way that if you double a number and then divide it by two, you'll end up with the same result. Okay, and that ha uh, holds here too, because once you square a negative number, it becomes positive, and then you're allowed to take its square root. All right, so don't forget that. So if you, anytime you square a negative number, like negative three squared is positive nine. Now we're gonna introduce some new interesting ideas here. Um, let me write a list of square roots. Now, all right, let's hold on a second. Um, I'm going to write a list of numbers. What do these numbers have in common? That's correct, whoops. So this is one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, five squared, six squared. So you get the idea here. And that means if I take the square root of any of these numbers, I'm going to get an integer. For example, this last one is just eight. So these numbers have a very special name in math. These are, these are called perfect squares. <clears throat> so it's a very special, it's like a very exclusive club 
within the real numbers, there's not that many numbers that get to be perfect squares, are there? So if you're a member of this club, you're feeling pretty good about yourself, aren't you? <laughs> but yes, so the idea here is that these are perfect squares. Now, we can tie this back to our discussion about rational and irrational numbers in the following important way. If the square root of x is rational, then x is known as a perfect square. So um, uh, actually, let me write it out like this. Uh, the square root of a perfect square is rational. And I'll put in parentheses here because it is an integer. The square root of any other number is irrational. Now that's kind of interesting. That means most of the square roots are irrational. Okay, so that's the rule with square roots to tell whether they are rational or not. If we're taking the square root of a perfect square, that is a, um, a rational number. If we're taking the square root of any other number, the result is irrational. So just as a quick example, um, that clearly means that, for example, radical 25 is rational, but radical three is irrational. How do you know? Because 25 is a perfect square and three is not a perfect square. And that's what we need to know. How interesting. Is that easy to keep track of? Yes. And so remember earlier we said that there's, um, we gave a list of three different irrational numbers. One of them was the square root of two. And now you know why. <clears throat> remember way, way, way back in the beginning of this discussion, um, where was that? Oh yeah, there we go. The square root of two is irrational. Two is not a perfect square and you can see why, because it is the number of digits is infinite and they're not repeating. And that's going to be true for the square root of three and five and seven and you know, all of the numbers except the perfect squares. Now, I, if I can find a video about this, I will, but here's an interesting uh, blast from history. Um, you might recall from your travels, the Greek mathematician Pythagoras. Oh my God, yes. Who could have forgotten our old friend Pythagoras? What was he so famous for? Famous for his theorem. Which is? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's right. Oh my God. How it all comes flooding back. Yes, the Pythagorean theorem, which is of course A squared plus B squared. Some things you never forget. That's right. Now, by the way, there's a special name for C. What is this called? C, ah, you have the to remember. The hypotenuse. Man, let's see this stuff. You never, you'll, just, when, believe me, when you have your retirement party all these years in the future, you'll still remember the hypotenuse. In fact, put it on your, your cake, all right, just to show off that you still remember this. Put a right triangle here and everyone say, wow, you are a genius, aren't you? Out of trauma, <laughs> the hypotenuse. No, it was fun. 
Yes, they do. Yes, they do. <laughs> All right. Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, Pythagoras, of course, was a Greek mathematician. Uh, I don't remember exactly when he was alive. We can look that up. Oh, no. That's stuck in your memory, too, huh? All right. Well, you see, that's what I mean. A lot of the stuff is stuck there forever, whether you like it or not. Uh, you see that? Well, while you're at it, who remembers the um, Einstein's famous equation? Did that stick? E equals MC squared, of course, that's right. Okay, so Pythagoras, uh, let me just quickly look up his years of, uh, that he was alive, just because it's, I know it was BC, but I don't remember exactly when. Uh, here we go. 570 BC to 490 BC. Okay, so here's the thing about Pythagoras. Um, Pythagoras was a leader. He was sort of like a, a like this cult figure that people would follow him around just to get words of wisdom. Anything they could, he could tell them, they were going to eagerly hear it. He's a cult figure with many um, avid followers. And they'd follow him around, him around the streets uh, and just, just to get any words of wisdom they could out of this guy because he was seen as this genius, this guy who um, everybody wanted to know more about. But yeah, I guess so. Without TV, yeah, he was that in that level. Um, but here's the thing. Pythagoras had this world philosophy that... Um, the, um, everything in nature could be reduced to perfect squares or circles or spheres or, you know, in other words, he was, a, he was primarily above everything else, uh, a geometry um, guru, like I guess you could say. And so they were always looking for evidence um, that everything was in fact composed of perfect squares and circles and triangles and all the rest. So what happened was um, he discovered that the square root of two is irrational. Now, what happened was <clears throat> he and his followers decided to keep this knowledge secret because they were worried the public knew they would revolt. In other words, this knowledge, they felt it was so important that they did, had to keep it out of the hands of the masses because they were worried that the public would revolt because this basically was evidence against their idea that everything was a perfect square or a perfect circle. And so it sort of was like um, a way of overturning people's common beliefs. And so you could see why they thought, uh oh, if people find this out, they're going to be very upset because this contradicts everything they think they know. And so we better keep this quiet among ourselves because, the, you know, these peasants will not appreciate this knowledge. And so um, that, that's but I mean, that's how important math was at this point in time. Imagine people being so concerned about math, like imagine the headline of The New York Times being something about the square root of two. You think that would ever happen? <laughs> Not in this day and age. No. But so this, everything in math, like I said, everything in math really has a very interesting history. Um, I'll try to see if I can get a video about this little episode as well. But um, Pythagoras was, you know, like this gigantic towering genius. And um, people followed him around and they just wanted to know what this guy had to say about everything. And, uh, and he was aware of this. He's, you know, he didn't exactly have a small ego either. And so there's a lot of these famous figures in history that are responsible for a lot of what we know today. Um, but the Greeks were primarily interested in geometry. Now, um, since it's like, all right, I'll tell you what, what time is it? All right, I'm, um, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, because it, it's almost time to go anyway, uh, I just wanted you to know this other interesting fun story. 
uh, based on math. Now, you may have also heard of this famous figure named Archimedes. I think he may have been a contemporary of, um, I don't know, let me double check. We're, oh no, that was, he was later, uh, 287 BC uh, up to 212 BC. All right, anyway, what is he famous for? Um, you may have heard the story, um, had an inspiration while in the bathtub. Does anyone know this story? And he ran up, ran down the streets. Yes, ran down the streets yelling, Eureka, which means I've discovered it or I've found it, but he forgot to put on his clothes. <laughs> okay, he's like, ah, look what I've discovered. Anyway, so what, what does this have to do with anything? Now, at this point and throughout much of history, paper has been incredibly expensive to produce. Um, for many years, humanity used something called vellum, which is basically sheepskin. So what happened was Archimedes wrote a book on vellum. And what happened was it found itself in a library in, I believe, France. And in the medieval times, a monk apparently found this book and thought, you know, nobody's going to read this book. I'll tell you what I'll do. I have something I want to write in here. So he scraped all the ink out of it and he wrote something else in that book. So the book was lost to history until a few years ago when the technology became available to go in with these special machines that are like x-rays and read what was originally underneath what the monk wrote. So they're able to recover all of Archimedes writings in this book because the vellum State retained the impression of the ink that uh, Archimedes had originally used. So the book was recovered. And of course it turned out to be a really important and pathbreaking, but the book was lost to history because this monk decided, oh, who cares about math? And he basically erased what it said, but now it's possible to find it because the technology is so advanced. I don't know what he wrote, but it couldn't have been that important compared to what Archimedes was writing. I mean, this is one of the greatest mathematicians who's ever lived. So let's just say it was a great day for the human race when this technology became available. They use the same thing now to look at artworks and see, like if they're trying to figure out like um, how to re restore a painting, they can look through it and see what was underneath all the paint. And in fact, sometimes they discover that these great paintings have been changed by the artist since the original sketches were made. Okay, so um, anyway, so this is, I don't know, this is apropos of nothing, but I thought you'd find this interesting. So what we need to do now is carry on with our discussion about roots and radicals, but it has to wait, unfortunately, till next Monday. It's time to go. Are you sad? Yes, you are, I see it. Okay, that's fine. So what I'd like you to do between now and Monday is just simply read through the slides and um, just make sure you're keeping up with what we're doing. So we're sort of halfway in between 5B right now. We're done with 5A, we have 5B, and then we'll just keep going. When we get to the end of the chapter, we'll do some problem sets, okay? And if I can find some more fun videos, I certainly will, because that certainly does help make this seem a little more interesting, doesn't it? I think so. All right. So in the meantime, I guess um, we have to go now. And so I'll see you all on Thursday. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.